Before I start my presentation, my name is Mo Agostino, Chief Commodity Strategist with Farms.Commerce Management, and we help farmers do a better job of marketing the products they produce on their farms. We work with farmers and um, businesses across North America. There's a lot of information, a lot of moving parts. I'm going to basically cover every risk on your farm from inflation to interest rates to fertil the F word, fertilizer, um, um, basis, you name it. Okay, we're going to try to cover every risk on your farm. So yesterday, the Buenos Aires Grain Exchange, everybody's heard about the Argentine drought. Okay, if you haven't, you're, you've been sleeping under a rock somewhere. But Buenos Aires went to 27 million metric tons. You gotta remember how severe this drought is. We started at 55, okay? So you're down almost 30 million metric tons. Yesterday, the USDA came out with a March crop report and they, they went down to 33. So they were more than expected. But the, remember, you're playing a game called the USDA. Do you guys love the USDA like I do? I'm kidding you, I hate them. Why? Because they're rear view mirror looking agencies. They're not forward looking like I am. So they, they're very slow to adjust. And I complain about the USDA because I want them to send the right signal. If we have a drought, if the bushels are not there, why aren't you telling the market to go ration that demand with higher prices so we can buy acres and fix the balance sheets? They don't do that, unfortunately. So my title is Conquer the Volatility, How High is High? And you'll understand why I called it that as we get into the presentation. So this was my tour from last year. And... Uh, we were projecting a 186.6 on corn. How many guys participated in the tour last year? Few? Boy, I'm doing something. I'm scratching my head. I'm doing something wrong. I, I don't know. Maybe you guys, uh, have you heard of it at least? Okay. <laughs> you should participate. So we got 60 scouts that go out and do corn, soybean yield checks. Myself and Greg Stewart, he works with Mazex as a chief agronomist to the tour. So we like to pick on, on a few farmers. Um, I try to visit with a new farmer every year. And so we came up with a 186.6. The Agricor final yield. Now we compare to Agricor because Agricor insures 80% of the acres. Your number one rule this year should be to get crop insurance. I'm gonna warn you right now, okay? If you don't, I can't help you. Anyways, um, we've, in the last five years, we've been within 1% of that final yield. I think most farmers would agree that you had better than expected yield, except some of those clay areas or maybe some of those dry areas, those sandy areas. Uh, but it was a, a pretty good yield compared to obviously last year's record yield. There's two final events to that tour, one in Chesterfield, one in Woodstock. The one in Woodstock this year is August 31st. Feel free to fill out the form for the tour, participate. It's all free, free food, uh, great information, lots of demo experts. I'm trying to bring in the Hefty Brothers from South Dakota. You guys heard of the Hefty Brothers? All about agronomy. I don't know. I can't promise you that I can bring them in. Very expensive. They don't like to travel from South Dakota to Woodstock because there's no direct flights. Now, this was before COVID. Maybe they've changed their minds. Uh, they haven't said no to me, so that's good news. Anyway, um, how many people have heard of the 89-year drought cycle? You must be clients of mine. If you haven't, I'm trying to make you aware, okay? Don't shoot the messenger here. I've done my homework. I studied under a, a guy by the name of Dr. Elwin Taylor from the University, sorry, Iowa State. He's no longer um, a professor or he's retired and he's got dementia or Alzheimer's. So I don't even know if he remembers me at all, but it's too bad. Because I really want to, because this thing, according to him, so he goes back to 400 years of tree rings. Why tree rings? Because tree rings show you how much moisture you got during that year. And he says, this is what Mother Nature does every 89 years. Now, some will, will call it climate change. Some will say we made it worse because of gas emissions. I think it's all a scam. <laughs> it's all about money. Um, just like I think EVs is a scam. You know, these leaders that we vote in, 
they decide this is what should be the policy, and then they shove it down our throats and they expect us to agree to it. We need to change, I'm getting too political with you, but we need to change of the guard because we need some fresh faces. Anyways, um, this is supposed to peak in 2025, and if you go back to the 1930s, Dust Bowl, you've heard of the Dust Bowl? Um, 1934 is supposed to be like 2023. I'm questioning that right now because we're not really seeing it per se, but I'll get into all of that here in a second. So this thing's supposed to peak in 2025 and a lot of Ontario farmers will ask, oh, is it gonna really affect Ontario farming? Well, I'll talk to the farmers in air this year that had no ears on their corn. It can. So you, you guys are buffered because of the lakes. So when it gets dry, moisture creates more moisture. But if you're in California and you don't have moisture, it just turns drier and drier and drier. Now, I think the 2,500 mega drought in California has finally been busted, um, but uh, the Western Corn Belt still remains quite dry. Um, I'll, I'll just stop there for a second. So this past weekend in that U.S. Panhandle, so which includes the Western Oklahoma, uh, Tex Northwest Texas, Kansas, they just experienced another derecho storm. 114 mile per hour winds, They're comparing it to the Dust Bowl of the 1930s. A lot of these local farmers are saying, all that wheat we planted, 80% of it's gonna be abandoned. But why is wheat falling? Doesn't make sense. Um, are they gonna plant corn and beans into the spring? Most likely not, unless moisture shows up. But what do they need? They need feed for cattle. So what are they gonna plant? Well, they know how to plant sorghum. It's a dry land crop requires less moisture and you can insure it. So I expect sorghum acres to go up in the new crop year. USDA is not forecasting that. Now this is Western Canada from 2021. So remember, I don't know when mother nature is gonna hit you, how hard or what's gonna happen. This was 21, in the middle of June, 120 degrees at the reproductive stage. It was bad timing and it cut the crops in half. So we all knew that genetics are better, right? And they can withstand a little bit more drought, but still cut it in half. This Argentine drought is a lot worse than Western Canada. I'll get to that in a second. This is the Po River, Rhine River, France and Italy last year, the 500 year European drought. It's been sort of fixed, but they're getting hot again and dry. And again, I didn't predict that as well but it's part of that 89 year drought cycle and then here comes 2022 23 and mother nature picking on argentina and i gotta i gotta make sure you understand this this is a lot worse than the drought in western canada in 2021 why because argentina has experienced seven consecutive months of dry weather hot weather below average precipitation then mother nature throws a frost on the beans and corn, an early frost like you would have here in August, and it, it turned what was bad, really just turned it worse. Remember that seven months of consecutive dry weather, that's 100 degrees almost every day. Have you guys ever experienced 100 degrees every day here in Ontario? No. But what about if that happens? What I'm trying to get to, you, the message I'm trying to come across with you is please prevent yourself from pulling the trigger too hard. Because if you pull the trigger too hard, you end up leaving some money on the table like you have the last three, four years. And then what about if mother nature turns dry? And you don't have those bushels to meet that contract. What are you gonna be doing? You're gonna be buying out those contracts. Talk to a Western Canadian producer that did that. They were spending $500,000 buying out contracts. I don't wanna go down those, those, those roads. So this is uh, crop conditions for soybeans and corn. They're just really bad. It's a, a 60 year low or 60 year first drought. Here's the United States. See that circle? That's the Eastern Corn Belt. It was dry in November, but mother nature provided snow blankets, moisture, and they've been fixed. But you can see that middle of the United States, that's the Western Corn Belt. It's still very, very dry. I think the only exceptions may be the Northern Plains. They're getting another snowstorm of eight inches. They're tired of snow. They just got too much snow. Um, so the USDA is saying, hey, 
we're going to have a normal growing season this year, and the corn yield is going to be 181 and a half. How are you going to grow corn at 181 and a half with the Western Corn Belt still so dry? It's almost impossible. Okay, so I think the USDA is full of smoke and mirrors, to be honest with you. So take it with a grain of salt. Last year, they were projecting corn ending stocks at 1.9 million plus, uh, 1.9 billion plus bushels. It came in at 1.2. Yes, sir. Is it red? I yes, the, the, so the red, the question is, what is the red? Red is extreme drought. There's different categories. So. If you look at the very top, I don't have my glasses, but um, it says uh, abnormally dry, moderate dry, severe, um, extreme, and then exceptional. So the red's in that extreme exceptional drought. This is Western Canada. 66% um, of the prairies are in a drought. That's up a couple points from last month. So there's still a lot of concern, particularly in that very southern portions of Alberta, Saskatchewan, and Manitoba. And so this is what Mother Nature's picking on right now. They're picking on Argentina, they're picking on South Africa, Australia, and India. So India might have a smaller wheat crop, but they don't necessarily export a lot of that wheat. I also have to talk about this volcano in the island of Tonga in the middle of the Pacific Ocean, south of the Fiji Islands that you guys have been visiting on vacation while you're ready for plant 20. No, I'm just kidding. Um, but this volcano is crucial because the scientists, this was an underwater volcano um, and it spewed a ton of water into the stratosphere equivalent to 145,000 megaliters. That just blows my mind. And what they're saying is that it acts as a, um, a cap or, or a, uh, traps the heat on planet Earth. And they're saying that this could affect climate around the globe for the next five to 10 years. And so if you believe in this 89 year drought cycle, it's only gonna make it worse. Everybody's been talking about switching or transitioning from La Nina, which is a dry weather pattern, to El Nino, which is a wetter pattern. The faster you transition, the quicker the US Corn Belt remains high and dry. I don't think it's gonna happen, but see that red line? It's called the Southern Oscillation Index. When it drops, that means you're switching or transitioning into an El Nino. When it goes up, you're sticking with La, La Nina. And that La Nina has been with us for three consecutive years, which is very rare. The reason why I think you're not gonna to transition to El Nino, because if you go back to 1850, there's only been one time, it's very rare in the, in the spring that it's done this, which it looks like it's doing now, and only one other time in the fall. The funds are critical. So what the funds flows are doing is critical to your bottom line. So the funds are very long corn at 2,000. I mean, it's not extremely long, but I mean, they can go as high as 400,000. And they've been selling this market lately. So if they're reducing that long position, it's gonna push those prices lower. Beans, 165,000. The beans have been the bigger, best performer of all the top three, corn, beans, and wheat. And of course, a very long meal. They're very short wheat. Now, they're not record short at 71,000, but at some point, if this market's gonna turn, you're gonna get a short squeeze. You've heard that term, short squeeze? This thing will scream higher, okay? And I think that's gonna happen sometime in Q2 second quarter of 23. And then you can also see their short canola and slightly short the lean hogs. China is reopening for business. That's good news, right? Should be eventually, but I think they still have to go through herd immunity and it could take them another month or so. I've heard where schools are closing down because kids are getting sick again. So I'm not sure they're quite out of it. There's some, the economic data that's coming out is mixed. Some showing a big recovery, others not so much. But here's the point. The recovery is gonna come from the consumer. I call it revenge spending because of COVID. They've been, you thought you were locked down on COVID? <laughs> you haven't seen anything yet, go to China. They were locking your door, like they were basically soldering your doors. You couldn't leave your place. So unless you had enough food, you couldn't get out. 
you, you, you can order um, skip the dishes or whatever, but how are they going to get into your apartment? So it was crazy. Um, but they saved up, according to government data, $2.6 trillion worth. And some say that if the consumer wants to spend 400 to 600 billion of that, it's going to add 0.5 to 0.75% to global GDP. But this economy is confusing to a lot of economists. It's not doing what it should do. And I know I shouldn't say this, but it is different this time. The old saying is, no, eh, it's not really different this time, Mo. But it is because of COVID. So I think it's bullish ag, it's bullish the global economy. That demand may not show up till the second half. So I would kind of ignore what the market's doing right now because it, it's not really justified. And I'll explain why. The, the impact of the Black Sea grain initiative. So on March 18th, last November, Turkey and Russia and Ukraine agreed to renew this grain deal where we keep exports moving out of the Black Sea grain uh, region. This is supposed to get approved on March 18th. They're talking about it. I think Putin probably doesn't want to do it. But for some reason, Turkey always seems to get this thing signed. Again, I'm going to get political with you, but why are we doing this war? Why isn't somebody trying to negotiate peace? Why is the U.S. sending military equipment? If, they didn't, if Ukraine didn't have that U.S. military equipment, they wouldn't have won this war. They don't have the resources. Now there's rumors that China is going to supply military equipment to Russia. That's World War III. And then Putin, of course, has threatened with nuclear weapons as well. So we'll see. Um, again, I go back to the change of the guard. We need new blood, new leadership, because the leadership we have now just is not working. So this is weighing on the wheat market. And because the wheat market is lower, it's pulling down corn as well. But one thing I know about Ukraine is that the crops are getting smaller. They're getting cut in half this year. If you think the war is going to continue a year from now, they're going to get cut again in half. And at some point, we don't have that competition from the Black Sea region, other than maybe Russia. But Russia is stealing grain from Ukraine. That's why their crops are so big, but you'll never know for sure. And so at some point, the rest of the world will have to fill that gap. But if I'm telling you that Mother Nature is not going to allow the globe to overproduce because of this drought, mega drought around the globe, then prices are gonna to have to go much higher to ration that demand. This is the US dollar index. So you can see the US dollar index bottomed in February around 100. It peaked at 114 way back in October of last year. And why did it all of a sudden start to go back up? It's kind of a reverse courses because the Fed was testifying in front of Congress the last couple of days and he basically uh, reiterated his thoughts that interest rates have to go higher for longer. If you go back to past periods when we've been in the similar situation where we're trying to crush inflation, interest rates usually have to go higher than inflation or to crush it. We're not even there yet. So now the market's worried that the US Fed has to go to 6%. The peak supposedly was supposed to be five, five and a half. And now some are even talking seven. Well, you add a three points to that, now you're talking double digits of interest rates in the United States. You think that's gonna cause a recession? So far it hasn't. The US consumer just continues to spend money, has a job. And by the way, what's up with the labor market? Why is the labor market just sky high? It's red hot. If you're raising rates, that labor market should be coming down and it's not. So it's confusing everybody. They'll write new books about what happened during this period. And so if interest rates are going to stay higher for longer, and maybe we peak sometime in the first half of 23, by the way, EPI data comes out on the 14th next week. If that number in the U.S. is still six, six and a half, and it's not doing anything, and I'll tell you why I don't think it's doing anything, because I think there's a bunch of price gouging going on. We just heard a bunch of CEOs, grocery CEOs, talking to Parliament with Trudeau and whatever his name is, Singh. <laughs> Anyways, um, they're saying we're denying that there's price gouging. It's not the grocery stores that are doing it. It's the companies that sell the products to them. Is your grocery bill up 6%? Mine is 
through the roof. They're up 30, 40, 50, 60 percent. How do you fix inflation when these guys are taking advantage of us? That's my concern. Okay? So, but here's the good news. So if this is going up, it's weighing on the Canadian dollar. And the Canadian dollar hit a low of 72 cents in October. So here's the Canadian dollar. So it bottomed in October at 72. Tried to rally, but if you look at my red two lines, I'm trying to connect the dots. I call that my downward sloping downtrend. Okay? And you can see at the far top left, the funds will start to sell it. Then they'll stop and they'll buy it back. Then they'll sell it and they'll remain within this range. And each time they do that, they make money. But it can never break above the 100 day moving average, which is the magenta purple line. It will act as a resistance. And each time they do that, they go to new lows. The highs are lower and the lows are lower. Got it? That's good for you, why? Because your basis goes up. Have you seen your soybean basis? At plus five, is that record strong? For this time of the year it is. I've got the data, the highest is in that 650 to six and three quarters, but typically that, you don't see that till August, September when you're in between old and new crop. But if this dollar breaks 72, you're going to 68 and a half. What do you think that bean base is gonna do? You might see a six. If you see a six, are you gonna do some, who has old crop bushels in a bin somewhere? Any beans left? So you could do a six. You're gonna to say to me, Mo, I've done basis contracts and they cost me money. Shaking me around. At six though, I don't think you can go too far wrong because historically that's high. So you have to understand what's the high, what's the low. Is six a really good number? Yes, it is. Okay. Stock market, and eh, it's range bound. It's confused. It, 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 it's hoping the Fed will pivot sooner, but he's saying, oh, I don't think I'm going to do that. Now we got to wait till 2024, but it hasn't been a catastrophe for the stocks because earnings have not been a catastrophe. So I pick on Amazon. Everybody says, oh, look at all the massive layoffs from these big companies. But we were all spoiled the last 10 years with zero free money. And these companies overdid it. They overhired, had huge growth. Now that growth is slowing down and they have to balance between growth and operating costs. So they're trying to lower that operating cost and they're getting, I call it, they're getting rid of their fat. They're getting rid of that extra, right? just to bring things back in line. So it's not a, a huge deal. I think once the Fed starts to pivot, remember the stock market's a six month discount mechanism. It's gonna look six months out. If they have some inclination, expectation that the Fed's gonna start to pivot in 24 and you'll know that when inflation starts to come down. Remember, the Fed is trying to see, he wants 2% inflation. Are we going back to 2%? That might be the old world. Maybe the new world's three, but he's stubborn. He does not want to change that 2% at all. I, it doesn't matter what you say to them. So we'll see. Um, some think that he's been too slow to raise those interest rates. We should have ripped the Band-Aid early on last year, and maybe we'd be in a better case scenario. Honestly, why did we go on lockdown for COVID? We should have never done that. That was a mistake, but that's just me. Crude oil, who needs diesel fuel? We haven't booked it yet. I've been watching, waiting patiently. And you can see my downward sloping downtrend again. In, uh, so March of 2020, we were booking diesel fuel at 55, 60 cents. We're using those max contracts that go out six months, one year, two years. We did it again in December of 2021 at 95 cents to a buck. Now my clients are calling me and saying, Mo, a great deal, but now they don't offer it anymore. Why? Well, we cost them money because the companies that were offering it didn't hedge it. So they didn't think the crude was gonna go back to 120, and of course it did. And so now I, I've caused issues because now you guys can't, book for it on those max contracts. You can fill up your tanks, but I like to lock in a, a really low price long-term. Anyways, 
you can see here, just like on that Canadian dollar chart I showed you earlier, the magenta line, it can't break through that 100-day moving average. There's fear about too much supply, not enough demand. It depends on the day. If the market thinks that that Chinese demand is going to show up, it's up three bucks. When they think that eh, maybe it's not, it's down three bucks. I'm hoping at some point it breaks that 70. We're, we're in that one, depending on the region, but you're in that 120 to 130 before tax. So you got 10, 20 cents downside, but 70, 80 cents upside. Do you want to pay two bucks a liter? Now at some point you got to book your diesel fuel. So the 130 still works on the balance sheets, but I'm wondering whether I can catch it a little bit lower. I don't know if he'll break 70 because the U.S. is buying crude to replace the reserves they took out last year, and they're buying between 65 and 70. So it's acting as an artificial floor. Okay, so but look for an opportunity to do your diesel before you get into planting season, okay? The F word, fertilizer, <laughs> nitrogen. How many guys have on-farm fertilizer and nitrogen for like 28% or 32%? For those of you who don't, get some. It's going to pay because the industry is changing. So there's been a couple opportunities where that 28% in August fell to about 600. Then recently I just heard it went to 500. But in order to take advantage of that lower price, remember it was much higher, you gotta take delivery, okay? The reason why 28 has fallen off the cliff is this is natural gas in the US. It was 10 bucks in August and some were projecting a super spike going to 1215. Oh, we're gonna have a polar vortex. We got lots of demand coming from the winter season. It's been less than desired. Yeah, we had a polar vortex, but it was already priced in. This thing fell to 208, and in the process, it took 28% down. Now, we've had soft demand because, remember, the U.S. farmer, he uses anhydrous more than you guys do, but they applied in the fall. So they applied half in the fall. They apply the other half in the spring. They were taking a wait-and-see attitude because they were tired of the price gouging and, and those big high fertilizer prices. So... Um, but I wouldn't wait till the spring because I think in the spring demand's going to return and logistics may pose a problem for you. Now in Ontario, I don't think logistics will be a problem. They probably need another 20% to fit the province's needs in the spring. They've got about 80% in storage right now. So there's your fertilizer prices. You can see anhydrous. This is USDA Illinois, US prices down 12%. We're still up 165% over the last two years, okay, in the last column. Uh, you got DAP down two, but up uh, 67. Uh, MAPS up 67, potash up 99, liquid nitrogen up 177, urea up 94.75 on farm diesel. What I'm trying to say is how many guys know their cost of production to the penny? If you don't, you should, why? This will be the most expensive crop year ever for you. Between equipment and land and inputs. And so you need to know that number why, because you're either making money. So if you own, if you've been around a while and you own all your land, your cost of production is low. I think you're going to be able to make money no matter what. But if you're renting land, it's expensive. And it's either you're going to be in a position where you're trying to limit your loss or make money. But you got to know that number. This was yesterday's USDA March crop report. Um, and you can see corn ending stocks up a little bit versus last month. Global ending stocks were up as well, although they were expected to come down. So that was a disappointment. This was a disappointment too because the USDA continues to pick on corn exports. The bears are clinging on that weak demand, high US dollar. But remember, corn exports are a small portion of the balance sheet. It's 2 billion bushels versus ethanol at 5 and feed at 5. If the USDA was picking on those two, I'd have a concern. They're not. They're picking on the smaller portion. Now, so corn exports are down 39% versus a year ago. It was minus 50, now 39. But the U.S. is the only game in town. So from here on in, if somebody wants to buy corn whether it's China or Mexico, which are big buyers, 
they got to turn to the U.S. Bills run out until August, okay? So can this export program come back? Can it catch up? Of course it can. So yesterday they lowered it again, and then this morning we hear that uh, we sold 1.4 million metric tons of corn, which is as long as you sell a million a week, you're going to meet that pace. And so we'll see what happens over the coming months. But I think the USDA is overdoing it. And because they're overdoing it, it's a, it gives the funds an excuse to sell. They do damage on the charts. And then you guys go ahead and panic sell. And it just becomes a uh, fulfilling prophecy with lower prices. Soybeans down to 210, down 10 from last month, which is bullish. I'm going to give away my first coffee. Does anybody remember how low that ending stocks number on beans was in 2012? Give me a number. 130. Anybody else? 100? Somebody in the back? 90? One more. How much? This is soybeans. Ending stocks on soybeans. That, that would be more like corn. Uh, who said 100? It was 115 in 2012. So remember, I talk about the USDA game. Are they ever going to print a number that low again? We could. We're, we're at a critical point here in 2023 where that may happen. There's no room for error, and I'll explain it in a second, okay? And then wheat uh, came in about neutral. Uh, the global numbers were a little bit lower, and soybean global numbers were even. This is Brazil and South America. They went from 47 on corn to 40, which surprised the market. They were only looking for 43. And then on beans, they went from 41 to 33, which again surprised the market because they were looking for 36. And by the way, I said earlier that the Buenos Aires Grain Exchange is down to 27. But I've heard of 25. It's a bad. There's some farmers on Twitter, if you go look at some of their photos, they're zeroed out. They're saying they're not going to harvest anything. That's how bad it is. So genetics are great, but... When, when, when the U.S. farmer in the panhandle is planting wheat into dust and it doesn't germinate, what do you think is going to happen? It's going to be abandoned, okay? So this is the total production for South America. So everybody was focused on that big record, South America, Brazil crop. It's record strong. Yes, it is, 148, somewhere in there. But the combined total, when you include Argentina, and I have it in at 31, but I adjusted the number on the title. It's 175. It's only up 2.5 versus last year. So everybody was focused on the monster crop that was coming, and beans are going back to 12, 13. How many sold 1840 beans in, at harvest? Now they're 21. You left some money on the table again because you weren't patient. I've been forecasting this Argentine drought forever. My number was 27 and a half, and Buenos Aires just beat me to the punch. By the way, it almost feels like a race to the bottom. Who can print the lowest number on the Argentine soybean crop? Literally, in the last few days, Cree, which is a local exporting company, came out with a 31, sorry, 31.2. Then Crop Scout Coordinator came out with a 31. Then the USDA comes in with a 33, although it wasn't lower. And then Buenos Aires comes in at 27. Here's the corn crop. It's early days, but because that Brazilian crop, soybean crop, was delayed to too much wet weather, it's delayed the planting and the second Safrina corn crop that makes up 75% of the production. So 30% of that corn crop is now delayed and subject to that dry season that happens in April. Now, is La Nina going to stick around for that second Safrina corn crop? I think it is. And so all of a sudden you could potentially have a haircut or production hiccup in the Brazilian corn crop, similar to 21, which is about 20% haircut. Well, the market's bearish on the U.S. corn export program. Now Brazil has a haircut. Now the world still needs to come to the U.S. They're going to have less. This thing's going to turn around. So that's why I say to you, be patient. But the USD is going to be very slow to adjust these numbers. It can take them months not days or weeks. The funds don't like months. They like to trade daily. There's ethanol. You know, it's kind of been average, nothing great. The good news is the Biden administration finally approved E15 year round starting in 24. Why he waited until 24 for some states. Well, what about the rest of them? 
I don't know. I don't, I don't understand how he thinks. Anyway, so um, I'm not too concerned about ethanol going forward. Um, corn exports are weak, as I mentioned earlier. Um, and then, uh, so there's your Brazilian uh, corn exports. Because of the geopolitical trade issues that China and the U.S. are having, um, I think China's trying to switch some of their sources to more Brazil than the United States. So the U.S. Brazilian corn export program may end up overtaking the U.S. And you can see it just soared here uh, in 2022. Uh, global stocks are tighter. So I talk about how tight the U.S. stocks are, the global stocks. That should put a floor under corn within this you know, we were in that six fifty seven dollar range. Now it's six to seven. The the range has gotten wider here lately, and I'll explain why in a second. Soybean exports, they were um, ahead of the USDA target. Now they've fallen behind by seven percent. Why? Because the Brazil beans are taking over. There's about 140 boats uh, destined for China down in South America, but. Um, we're within 143 million bushels of the USDA target. So I'm not too concerned with the marketing. We still got till September before the marketing year ends. So still got lots of time to meet that number. Uh, crush remains solid both in Ontario, the United States, Western Canada. I think the issue is not that the margins are not high. It's because they don't have enough bushels to crush. But again, the USDA is not telling you that story. And soybean ending stocks are pretty tight on a global basis as well. And then you got wheat exports down about 6%. Remember, U.S. wheat is expensive. U.S. dollar's too high. It's competing with that black sea grain, that Russian wheat. And one of the, I'll show you at the end, but watch Matif wheat, European Matif wheat, because last year it started to turn, went higher, and it, it took Chicago with it. You got to watch if that turns, because if that turns, uh, that's the bottom in the wheat market. Wheat ending stocks are at a... 15 year low for both the US and globally. So a lot of this was all about old crop. I'm gonna start talking a little bit about new crop. So there's a lot of numbers on here and I apologize if I go over your head, but stick with me, okay? So what I'm trying to show you here is can we, so we got a really tight corn balance sheet in the US right now. Can we fix that in 23? In other words, can we plant enough corn acres? Can we produce a yield that takes us from one, two, one, three ending stocks, which is tight, to maybe a one eight to two billion, okay? The USDA in the first column, right up here, says 91 million. In November, they were at 92, okay? Remember, the total pie last year came in at 176.6, which is a lot lower than most people thought. So there's about six million acres in prevent plant that may come back into production. By the way, there's some of my farmers in the United States I'll ask this question. So if a solar panel company came to you and said, I'm gonna give you 1,500 bucks an acre for 30 years, would you take that? 1,500 bucks an acre. It's a no brainer, isn't it? I would. That's what's being offered on the table in the United States. One of my hog farmers in Michigan got 1,200. For 60 acres, it was shitty ground, it didn't matter. And uh, he's happy, so. Um, what I'm trying to say to you is that between urbanization, solar panels, wind turbines, we're taking acres away. So, USDA says 181 and a half. I'm going to give my next coffee away. What was the record yield in the United States on corn? I don't care what year. What was the number? Because you guys won't know the year. <laughs> you guys forget like, like me. <laughs> I don't even remember what I did yesterday. Give me a number. Sorry? High 170. Well, give me a number. 178. 178. 220. 320. This is the national average, not a state average, national average. You're way too high. <laughs> You're still too high. <laughs> Sorry? 192? 187. 180. 185, one more. 196. Okay. Sorry? One eighty four. Ah, thank you. <laughs> 174.6. Sorry, 176.4. I got to get it right. And she was 178, so she was the closest, okay? 
So, but they use a formula. They have a model, and they say, well, we should be at 181 and a half. Well, with all those fringe states and the Western Corn Belt so dry, you think they can achieve a 181 and a half? You'd have to have a perfect growing season. You'd have to start planting mid-April or early April with, ha with no frost, by the way, because you're going to get frost through Mother's Day weekend, right? That's what happened the last two years in Northern Plains. All those beans got frosted. They had to replant them all. So they're saying we're going to go from a 1-3 and change to a 1887. And some of these guys in the United States are so bearish. If you believe them, you better go sell all your corn. 100% of your old crop in the bin. Go sell 100% of your new crop. Because we're going to 439. That's your number. I'm not here to scare you. I'm going to give you both sides of the equation, okay? So that's the bearish side. My source tells me that it's not 91, it's 89 and a half. I can only tell you that. And it's from a reliable source. So I don't believe the USDA pie in the sky, smoke and mirror stuff. I don't believe their farm surveys because you guys hate those farm surveys. You hate the USDA. You typically lie on those damn forms. Anyways... Um, so again, I'm not telling you that the USDA is going to print at 89 and a half because I don't trust them, but let's assume it's lower than expected. And I put the yield at 177, which would be a record high, which again, it, that's, that's, that's a tough number to get. And I get to 985 and I adjust demand lower because I can. What's coin going to do if it's 985? Now remember. What was the USDA projecting last year? 1.9 plus billion bushels. Where did it end up at? We're at 1.3. They were off by five to 600 million. Are they gonna do it again? It possibly could happen. If it's 92, and there's some at 92, 93, 94, anybody for 95? I don't think so. With a 177 and you go to 1.3, I, I've got, I've got um, uh, demand a little bit stronger. Now remember, I'm using a 1.1 for beginning stocks, which is not where it is right now. And then I put in 89 with a 173. Now remember, I'm going to give my last coffee away. What was the final yield in August of 2012 in the last drought in the United States? What was the final August national USDA printed number. 124, 123. Anybody else? 155. 116, 118. Who said 123? And he, unfortunately, he's a client. So he's paying attention. Catch. 122. And remember, so you got to understand how the game is played. What happened in 2012? The market, the funds were not paying attention to the drought. I'll be honest with you. I was the only one talking about it. And the guess who else was talking about that drought? Dr. Elwin Taylor, who's been talking about the 89 year drought cycle. Nobody was paying attention. Now I do also do a US crop tour. I went and did my US crop tour through 13 states, took 30 days to look at everything. I came back and said, don't sell another bushel until they get moisture. If they don't get moisture, this thing's gone. And what was the market doing in 2012? It did this. It stopped at six on July 1st, and then finally the funds got convinced there was a problem, and they panicked. They pushed the panic button. We went from six to 849, and it was over. Why? Because the USDA said it was 122. It wasn't any lower than that, the following reports. So the market created this short crop, long tail. And so when this thing peaks, this 89 year drought cycle peaks, you're gonna get the same thing. You have to be ready to take advantage of those prices, but the only person or farmer that's gonna win is bushels in a bin. My old saying the last four years was store and ignore. Still is, but my new one is bushels in a bin are not a sin. I like that one better. Anyway, you, tough crowd. <laughs> Soybeans. So. I'm saying that there's a possibility we could fix this tight balance sheet from one year to the next, but it depends on Mother Nature because yield is going to be the final production determinant. However, when you look at beans, 
we can't fix it because we're, this is USDA Ag Outlook Forum in February, 289. We're currently 210. 87 and a half, flat versus last year in acres and a yield of 52. I keep it around that 87 and a half or an 87 with a 49 and a 49 is pretty high. I mean, you guys just did 48.8 last year. I'm bringing a beginning stock down to 150 over the coming months. I think it gets tighter. You know, crushings are gonna stay high. Exports should stay high. China's reopening, they, they imported 91 million metric tons of beans last year. But the reopening, are we going back to pre-COVID where they're importing 100 million? Yeah, okay, so they still need two sources, South America and the US. They're not gonna buy everything from South America. So that number could surprise to the upside. I, all I'm saying to you is if you're gonna plant something, more of something this year, plant beans. So you know that Argentina's bad, the market's trading like it's priced in. Now we gotta figure out what the US acres are. What's the farmer gonna do? It's more productive, it's more profitable to grow corn. Now that fertilizer prices have come off, they might actually plant some more of that. So I have a lots of clients in the Eastern Corn, but what'd they do? They planted more wheat. Well, I, have, I put some soft red winter wheat in for the first time in a long time, why? Because I could, the price is good. Is the price good? Not anymore. Did they lock it in? No, of course not. So now what do they do? Well, there's, it's still looking okay. But what did that take away from? It took away from bean acres. I'm telling you that at the end of the month, USD is going to surprise with less bean acres, less corn acres, and less pie. We limit up. Okay. I think because of the lower South America crop, more demand down the road, less acres in the U.S., by May expiration, bean prices will be $16.55. You got to break $15.55. I'll show you that in a second. And then you can go to $16.55. But once you start to know more about new crop and you add that weather scare, and my weather forecasters are telling me that the eastern Corn Belt is going to be the dry spot this year versus the Western Corn Belt. The Western Corn Belt is going to get more rain, more storms, but it's the Eastern Corn Belt that's experienced hot, dry weather that the Western Corn Belt's experienced the last couple of years. So we'll see what happens. This is corn. So you can see how we peaked last year. Then we came down. This, this little decline here through July was worried. The funds were worried about the global recession. That still has not happened. And then this here, this I can't explain to you, to be honest with you. Um, it sort of started on February 24th when China, and China's been very neutral on the Ukraine-Russian war to date, but now they're speaking up and they came up with this 12-point peace plan. I talked to you about, you know, why isn't anybody trying to negotiate a peace plan? Well, I, I guess China is sort of doing that. And their number nine was, make sure you sign this renewal of this grain deal and keep those exports moving because we need feed for our people and hogs. And Surprise, surprise, the market drops. And what did we see today? China buying a ton of corn on that break because that's what they do. So this is going to create more demand. This drop will, so you don't need the panic sell here, okay? I think what, can we get down to this level here? Maybe, but I think six will be at your major support. And that's why I've said to you that the range bound trade is between this maybe six to seven, but I'm hoping that this thing bounces here shortly. So, um, March beans, remember my Canadian dollar downward sloping downtrend? Remember my crude oil downward sloping downtrend? Well, this one's the exact opposite. It's the upward sloping uptrend. I connect my dots and each time they go up and down, the highs are higher, the lows are lower, which is good for you, right? I think this thing again will break 1550 at some point. It's just a matter of time. You may have to wait till the end of the month. This is palm oil. This dictates what canola, what this, that vegetable oil complex does. They're having issues with uh, too much wet weather. So production's being impacted again. 
Um, this is soy oil. You've heard about that renewable diesel demand that's coming down the pike, all these plants getting built both in the United States and Western Canada. That's a couple years away. Okay, it's not here and now, but it's a couple years away. I don't, just to touch on that, if you were to meet, if all those plants were to be built, remember this is not a mandate like ethanol. This is just being driven by demand. But if you were to meet, meet, if all those plants get built, which I don't, the EPA doesn't think they'll get built, but if they did, you would have to plant all beans, which is not gonna happen. In a worst case scenario, you could maybe have to switch 10 to 15 million from corn acres to bean acres. That's still not gonna happen. So where are you gonna get all this? Probably from Brazil. This is meal. I don't have any more coffee. I want to ask another question. Why is meal soaring? Anybody? Lack of crushing. Lack of crushing. No. Drought in Argentina. Bingo. Argentina is the largest meal exporter in the world at 45%. They're also the largest soy oil exporter. And because their crop went from 55 to 25, and now they got to import to maintain a domestic market, meals exploding. Now, at some point, I just talked about all these plants and biodiesel and soil taking off because of demand. At some point, the U.S. is going to crush more for soil than meal. And then at some point in the next two years, I still think Mother Nature is going to prevent this from happening. But in the next couple of years, you're going to have excess meal. And so the price is going to drop. We've booked our meal all the way out to the second half of 24 for our livestock producers at an average of 377 US a short ton. Right now it's 500. If this thing breaks 512, you're going to see a hyperbolic move to 630, 640 by this summer. You could have bought it at 5, 600 Canadian. Now it's 900. You wait till this summer. If you're a livestock producer, you need to manage this better. Because if you're not managing your feed, the livestock price may not go high enough to cover it. I keep talking to cattle producers in Western Canada or the Western United States, and I said, Do you, I ask them one question. Do you have access to feed? If they say no to me, I say exit the business now because you're going to go bankrupt. Because I'm projecting a runaway bull market in cattle, and some of these cattle futures today are higher than 2012's high. But if you don't have access to feed because of the drought, it's gonna, it's gonna be painful. Here's canola. Anybody grow canola? It struggled because we went to 1200 in the drought. We kind of fixed that drought last year and it's struggling to gain any traction. And again, it's got that slightly biased downward uh, move, but I think 800 will hold this is European Matif wheat. I mentioned it earlier. And you can see the drop there. Sort of trying to find a bottom down here in this 280 level. So keep an eye on that. This is Chicago wheat. You can see the move down from last May's high. Um, this is Kansas. Kansas needs to hold that $8 for July. Um, Chicago wheat at seven and Minneapolis at 860. This is uh, cotton. I don't think cotton's going to gain any acres because the prices come down because of a lack of demand, because of worries about recession and Chinese. Um, I think we're going to take acres away, but I don't think you're going to add corn or beans down in the south because it's too dry. Um, here's lean hogs. Um, it's been weak seasonally because of a very weak cash market. And there seems to be more hogs than anybody expecting I don't know where these hogs are coming from I really do not know I'm scratching my head but I think by the summer the last couple years exports have saved the industry's bacon so to speak I think it's gonna do it again this year but you're gonna have to be patient we were booking hogs at the peak in August of last year I don't like selling waiting to sell into the cash market between January and April there's years like this year where it will surprise you and do nothing and you're going to leave money on the table. And then this is live cattle. It's just going to explode to the top side. The, the lower supply. So I'm going to give you some advice. Who likes eating beef? Most of you. 
Do you guys have a freezer? Is it full of beef? Yep. If it's not, go. You think it's expensive now? You wait the next three years. It's going to go through the roof. Feeder cattle, same thing. It's just going to take off. Again, some of the nearby contracts are already at all time record highs. Now imagine if corn goes to $12. Futures. Remember, all these numbers I've showed you is futures. Then you got to add or subtract your basis. What about if Mother Nature provides a global production issue on corn? Everybody's just getting hit hard. How high do you think corn can go? Remember my title, How High is High? Expect the unexpected. Adjust your price. To, I know these are great prices, but this, these could, this is the calm before the storm, okay? Your corn basis, you can see that it got up to about 192 over when the dollar was 72 cents. But we have an issue with corn in Ontario. We had too much wheat, then too much beans, then too much corn, and it plugged the system up. The east is worse than the west. The west is trying to buy some corn for the boats. It was in that 865, 875. It's probably lower now. Um, but at the peak, with the $2 and the $7 corn, you're getting $9. How many guys sold $9 corn? That's a good price. That's the high for the year. Okay. I still think you're going to revisit that, but you're going to have to wait till the Q2 period. Um, so there's your net price up to that nine. And then here's your beans. We got to $5 over again, that lower dollar. So because demand is soft on the corn, the EU typically buys Ontario corn. The big ethanol players are telling me, oh, Ontario corn is expensive. I'm going, if I compare it to basis across the region, it doesn't look expensive to me, so I don't really know. It, it could be a transportation thing. But look for that two over on corn. Look for, because demand on beans is stronger than corn and wheat, you're going to see a bigger movement in the bean basis. So look for that six over. And don't be afraid to book some basis on that. Uh, there's your flat price, you know, above that 20 bucks. And then you got... Soft red winter wheat, it got up to a plus two, it's come off. We planted 1.3 million acres. You guys produce a 100 bushel record crop again, that's gonna weigh on basis. So if you get a temporarily break in the Canadian dollar and this basis is back to two over, don't be afraid to do it. The high is in that 235, okay, historically. Doesn't get much better than that, all right? Join our program. You can try it for free. We got a marketing app, keeps you informed every day. Thank you very much, folks, for coming. I really appreciate it. Enjoy the rest of your day. You're going to miss that snowstorm that's coming in tomorrow. Do you have any other questions for me? Any questions? Yes, sir. Yeah, Bank of Canada interest rates going forward. They just decided to remain flat in this last announcement. They think inflation is coming down. I hope they're right. Uh, but I don't know. I, again, I'm worried about that price gouging. So in the United States, they're looking at half a point again um, here the next meeting in March. So unfortunately, they're going to have to go higher. Typically, you know, lately through this period, the Bank of Canada seems to be leading instead of being a follower. I don't know why they're trying to do that. But anyways, because typically they would just follow what the U.S. would do. But I don't know. They're trying to be leaders instead of followers, I guess. Uh, sort of a good thing. Um, so, like I said earlier, probably peak mid-year. Inflation's key. That will determine whether that stays longer for higher. So, on March 14th, if it's six and a half, <laughs> that's a problem. Yes, sir. Explain the ending stocks number on beans. The oh, the negative. So what, what, I, what I'm showing there, and so he, he brings up a good point. So his question is on my new crop projection on soybean balance sheet ending stocks. So he's referring to these numbers here. This minus 61 and minus 72. That's because when I lower the acres and the yield, but I don't adjust demand. What I'm trying to show there is that the USDA is never going to print a minus 72, but what futures are going to have to do is go through the roof to ration that demand. 
And so maybe the USDA at some point prints 100, but futures are going to be that much higher. Okay? What I'm try just trying to say is that there's not enough acres or yield with demand so strong to maintain a positive number. Okay? Clear as mud? <laughs> Any other questions? Yes, sir. Well, so, you know, the, 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 the experts always use the U.S. dollar as an excuse. Oh, the high U.S. dollar is causing issues for exports. Well, when the U.S. dollar was down to 100, did it really improve exports? Not really. And when it was 114, not really. I don't know. I, I think it, what's more important is what the U.S. dollar is doing versus other currencies, not necessarily just looking at what it's doing here in North America. So uh, I don't buy it. Any other questions? Yes, sir. Yeah, so um, uh, the question is what happened with Mexico because they don't want to take that U.S. GMO corn. Well, I, under the NAFTA agreement, they have to. Otherwise, it's a violation of that. And Vilsack, the Ag Secretary, says um, it's, it's not based on science. <laughs> it's just something that they want to do to reduce. It's going to increase consumers' costs through the roof. So they're going to end up going to court if, if this, because it's a new guy in power. And uh, yeah, they're going to go to court if, if he decides not to change the way things go. So is it an issue? Because Mexico is a big buyer of corn, so it's a good question. Again, going back to that corn export program and still a small portion of the balance sheet. So just remember that. Any other questions? Thanks, folks. Congre